Well, the last time we looked at this uh, letter together, we began to look at chapter 7. And when we began on that occasion, I made four important observations. They were observations. They were not specific engagements with the text, but they were observations in many ways of things which are drawn to our attention when we come to this particular chapter. The first was that this is one of the most debated and controversial chapters in this letter to the Romans. I think we've seen by now that Paul's letter to the church at Rome is a very important, powerful, wonderful letter. It's magisterial, really. Its great theme is the gospel of God, as Paul describes it in chapter 1. You remember his intention is to uh, use Rome as a kind of springboard from which he would take the gospel. That's his intention. He tells us later on in this letter to uh, people in Spain and in Western Europe. He wants to break new ground with the news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. We're also aware that he's coming to a church which was originally predominantly Jewish in its uh, makeup. They were Jewish converts. And then there was a terrible persecution against Jewish people in Rome by the Roman government. And so the Jewish believers, they have to run for their lives. And while they've gone, there's a little handful, it would appear, of Gentile converts. But while the Jewish Christians are away, God is still building his church. And so when the persecution is over and they come back, they find that they're now in the minority. Because the church at Rome is now predominantly made up of Gentile believers, pagan Who've, pagans who have come to faith in Christ. And so that created tensions, didn't it? Jew-Gentile issue is a big tension in our world today. It was a huge tension in the world 2,000 years ago. And there's big questions, aren't there, about how does the gospel relate to this massive ethnic tension? Does the gospel have to say, is the news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead the same for Jewish people and for Gentile people? And so Paul, as he makes his way through this letter, speaking of the glory of the gospel, is also seeking to apply it in these two big ways. Firstly, to his desire to prepare this sort of platform from which he'll take the gospel into Western Europe. And secondly to this whole area of the Jew-Gentile tension. Now, as we say, as we come to uh, Romans chapter 7, the first observation then we made is that this is quite a controversial passage. And the reason is for verses 14 to 25. We haven't got there yet. I'm not going to say anything about the controversy because I'm actually hoping that by the time we get there, there won't be a controversy in your mind. Because if we track what Paul is saying properly, really the question of who is the man in Romans 7, basically we realize is a bit of a non-question. Well, when you come to the second thing that we saw last time, it is that we, and this is important to today, that chapter 7 is the continuation of an argument that Paul is addressing in chapter 6. We began our reading this morning, didn't we, in verse 15. What do you see in verse 15? Well, there are two questions. What then? That's the first one. And then you get, shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Wonderful, isn't it? Not under law. Law, the terrors of law and of God, with me can have nothing to do. My saviors, obedience and blood, hide all my transgressions from view. What a wonderful thing you say that is. So now I can go out and live as I like. Is that the case? Paul is asking. And he is now dealing with that objection, and it is an objection, effectively, to the wonderful news of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone. So that's the second thing. Paul is dealing with this argument. As we come into chapter 7, you get these chapter headings. They didn't come until many hundreds of years after Paul wrote this. And sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. And in some ways, the heading, I think, in chapter 7 is unhelpful because you kind of think when you start chapter 7 as if Paul's speaking about something new. Well, he isn't really. He's still dealing with the question in verse 15 of chapter 6. And then thirdly, we paused last time to deal with two issues that our passage raises by implication because this passage is all about the law of God and how it fits into our understanding as Christians. 
And when it comes to law, as Christians, as genuine converted people, we are capable sometimes of falling into two big areas of error on the law. And you probably remember, as we looked at them last time, the first one is very well known. It's called legalism. That is that the Christian life, even though I'm forgiven, but my security in Christ and my joy in Christ really comes as a result of keeping rules and regulations in the Christian life. And tragically, there are Christians today uh, who can be bound up in these systems. So invariably, the rules and regulations are not ones found in the Bible. It's a bit like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. People add to them. So they say about whether you wear a tie or not on a Sunday, that's terribly important, how you spend your Sunday, whether you can watch television, play sport, all those sorts of questions. There's a right way and a wrong way, and if you're the right side of the equation, well, you're okay, and you have peace with God. That's legalism. I, those examples, by the way, I give you are not exaggerations. They are actual things, and there are many, many other things we could add to them. That's the first error, legalism. But the other one, on the other side of the errorometer, if you like, is what we call antinomianism. That is living without the law. And it's the opposite. And really, that's what Paul is dealing with in 6.15. Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? It's the idea, now that I'm a Christian, law doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter at all. And some of you may encounter this in publications today under the title of hyper-grace. It is a real problem in churches, in certain churches today, and it is a growing problem. It's the idea that grace is so wonderful, which it is. We've been singing about it this morning, and absolutely right that we do. But they take it further than the Bible takes it. Grace is not an excuse for immorality in our lives. Grace is not an excuse for wickedness and sin in our lives. Grace is never the excuse for us simply to shrug our shoulders and close our eyes to the reality of the presence of sin in our lives. So we must ever, when we deal with the issue of the law, be on the watch out for these two big areas of error, legalism and antinomianism. And by the way, it really is a sliding scale. And you and I are to be found slap bang in the middle because that's precisely where the Bible places us in the middle of a tension, if you like. And either side of that middle path, there is very, very dangerous quicksand for the believer. And then lastly, and I want to deal with this again, uh, just to not only remind you of this, but add a few things to it, because I think this is pastorally extremely important. I also picked up last time Paul's illustration in verse 2 and verse 3 of chapter 7, which is really the illustration of... Uh, of uh, remarriage. And I expanded this to say that there's the implication here, Paul uh, using this illustration, the implication is that of the issue of divorce and remarriage. And we made, if you remember rightly, a pastoral detour to look at this. Some Christians, as you know, will argue that remarriage after divorce, or for whatever reason, is always prohibited. I was told this week in discussion with a dear brother, uh, he, who told me that he knew of a couple who, the, the very day, I think, that they were married, and one of them was remarried after a divorce, were immediately excommunicated by the church that they were in. And invariably, Romans 7, uh, verses 2 and 3, are used to support this position that remarriage is never permissible for a Christian who has been divorced. And I reminded you last time that this passage is actually not about divorce and remarriage. It's not a comprehensive statement, in other words, on the issue. And so we must be very, very careful at extracting, if you like, a pastoral theology on divorce and remarriage simply from a passage like this where Paul is not dealing directly with the issue of divorce and remarriage. It's only been used as an illustration. That's why verse 2 begins with the words, for example, and so to use this uh, passage as the final word on divorce and remarriage for the Christian is somewhat reckless. And ultimately, we find on a wider reading of Scripture, it is at variance with, for example, Jesus' own teaching in Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19, verse 9, where he tells us, and I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. And that exception, marital unfaithfulness, 
is very important. Jesus clearly opens the door for remarriage after divorce. Now, again, I stress this with you this morning. There's been a lot of confusion on this issue over the years and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And it's all been as the result of the inability to handle Scripture correctly and honestly. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that we are to correctly handle the word of truth. That is not always easy. It requires, not only the, it requires ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit using our understanding and the minds which God has given us. Now, when it comes to interpreting the Bible, uh, there are always certain basic and important principles that we should apply to it. We call that area hermeneutics, but don't worry about that name. It's not that important how we handle scripture is. So for example, we all know I trust the context is very important. You know the little saying, a text without a context is a pretext. It is. We need to understand the context, otherwise we can come to some dreadful, dreadful conclusions and abuse the Bible effectively. You can get it to mean things that it doesn't mean. Now, when it comes to the issue of divorce and remarriage, there's often the failure of two important principles. The first is known as the analogy of faith. We're thankful to the reformers for this one. That is, that scripture is the thing that must interpret scripture, not culture, not you or me or my ideas or my upbringing or what someone may have told me in the past, but scripture must be primarily the interpreter of scripture. Another one, which is helpful in the area of divorce and remarriage, is what is sometimes known as the harmony of the gospels. That is that not all that Jesus has said about an issue is always recorded in one place. Let me give you an example. The last few Sunday evenings, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. We're going to continue to do that tonight. Luke 11, Father, hallowed be your name. But Matthew 6, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's a development, isn't there, in the Matthew account. It's not that Luke 11 is wrong, but there is an expansion and a development by the insertion of who is in heaven. When you put those together, you have a harmony. You see the same thing in the various ways in which the Gospels uh, recount Jesus' resurrection. So in the case of divorce and remarriage, and let's nail this now this morning. Mark 10, verses 11 to 12, tells us, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Now that appears to be saying what appears to be very similar in Romans 7 verses 2 and 3. That divorce is the end of it. If you do remarry, it's adultery. But as well as Mark 10, we also have, and I've already quoted this to you, Jesus' words in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5. Anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, these parallel passages, this is where you have the gospel harmony principle and also really the analogy of faith principle, scripture interpreting scripture. Jesus clearly expands on his teaching. We get more data, more information. So we must be very careful not to cherry pick only Romans 7 and Mark 10 to support an argument that says that any marriage after divorce is always adultery. If you do that, we miss the fact that Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 references are expanding and developing on this. In other words, Romans 7 and Mark 10 are not the last word. We have an expansion on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 that is not contradictory. It simply provides us with more information. So Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 show that marriage is sometimes permissible when unfaithfulness is the cause for the divorce. Now, failure to handle scripture this, in this comprehensive way is serious. It results in an inadequate grasp of the Bible's teaching on divorce and remarriage. And I'm stressing this with you. I realize Romans 7 isn't actually addressing directly the issue. 
But it's there indirectly, and it gives me the opportunity this morning to address this with you as a church and to make a pastoral application that I believe is very important because we all know brothers and sisters who have gone through the trauma of divorce. It's a dreadful thing. It really is. The Bible is clear. God hates divorce. And we also know those who have been on the receiving end of a relationship and when they have suffered the trauma of unfaithfulness. Now, for some of those, God in his gracious providence has opened the door to remarriage. We need to understand that there is a biblical argument that presents that as legitimate. Their marriage is legitimate. It is not adultery. It is grace and kindness from God. I'm aware that maybe some of you have a problem with what I'm saying to you this morning, and I'm sorry about that. But you really need to ask, why have you got the problem? Where did your understanding about marriage and remarriage originate? Maybe it's because of something you were taught in a previous church. Maybe it's how you think things should be. And maybe you've come to it through your own thinking. Well, I've shown you today that if you categorically reject remarriage after divorce in every case... You're ignoring, really, what our Lord has to say in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5. It's wrong, in other words, on the basis of what the Bible teaches, and you need to get your mind straightened out on this. And this is why Scripture is given. 2 Timothy 3.16, Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, but also rebuking and correcting, straightening us out. And we all need that. And training in righteousness. And so again, I use this opportunity to make what is a pastoral aside and to apply it to you and to appeal to you to think biblically on this issue as indeed we should always think on all the issues of life. Scripture is wisdom to live by. Well, that is enough of that now. The use of divorce and remarriage in Romans 7 is, as I say, only a passing illustration. Uh, But it has been given to address live issues. Now, the illustration for the Christian in Romans 7 is clear. Verse 4, you have died to the law. It's a wonderful statement. Paul goes on to tell us you're free of the authority that the law once had over you. And we died, he tells us in verse 4, to the law that we might belong to another. And the other that we belong to now is Jesus Christ. Verse 4, belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. It's a wonderful statement, isn't it? About where we are today as Christian people. We've died to the law, we now belong to Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead. Now what is the reason for our belonging? This is what Paul now wants us to think about in this chapter. And he gives us, really, two clear answers. The first is in verse 4, and the second is in verse 9. Let's take the first one. We have died to the law in order that we might belong to another, yes, but also in order that we might bear fruit to God. This is the purpose this morning, that you've been set free from the law. There is a very specific purpose and intention. It is that you might bear fruit to God. So free from the law is not free for all. That's what's wrong with antinomianism. It's a free for all. No, says Paul. You're not free for a free for all. You're free to bear fruit to God. This fruit to God thing is the middle path. The second one, look at verse 9. Second reason is for our belonging to Christ is that we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. And here Paul is dealing with a legalist, isn't he? Because the issue here is that we've been freed from what he says in verse 5, the controlling nat- uh, control of the sinful nature, which was pulling us this way and that way. We have been freed from that to now serve in the new way of the Spirit. It's about the Spirit now, and His work in us and through us and upon us, not about the strictures and the requirements of the law. 
So it's actually quite fascinating, isn't it? That what Paul is telling us here is that the reason we now belong to another, verse 4, and the other is the one who has raised us from the dead, is that, first of all, we might bear fruit to God and not be antinomians. That we might, in verse 9, serve in the new way of the Spirit and not be legalists. And so by bearing fruit to God and serving in the new way of the Spirit, we find ourselves on the middle path of authentic, biblical, joyful Christianity. So our release, and you have been set free. That's why that, that, I think that new version of Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace, is a very good one. Not all these attempts to play around with old hymns are very helpful, but I think this one is, because the added chorus, I, we've been set free. My chains are off. There's something quite Wesleyan about it, isn't there? But it's, it's beautiful language. That's the reality of the Christian life. The chains are off. The prison door is open. You are free. And in particular, it is a release from the authority or the power that the law of God once held over you. And you're now free to bear fruit to God and serve in the new way of the Spirit. Do you know it's powerful, isn't it? It really is. It's wonderful. Before you were a Christian, the law always had the last word on your life. It did. And the last word that the law always said about you was this word, sinner. And so whatever life you lived, and let's face it, some of us lived some pretty good lives before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. Some of us were very moral. Some of us were very kind, very thoughtful. But it was that amazing day when we discovered that being kind, good, religious, and thoughtful counts as absolutely nothing with God. Because no matter how good, kind, religious, well-meaning, generous, living we might be, there is always that dreadful word sinner over every single one of us. All our righteousnesses, Isaiah the prophet tells us, are as filthy rags. The very best we could offer God our finest hour, ultimately corrupt. The law always had the last word over you. It was a dreadful thing. You couldn't escape that. But now, being justified through faith, you have been made righteous in Jesus Christ. And the law has nothing to say about you. It can't say anything. It can't say sinner anymore about your life. Even though you sin, in the final analysis, you are safe and secure in Jesus Christ, dressed in his own righteousness. And so if the law of God ultimately is going to say anything over your life in the final analysis, it's going to say this. It's going to look at you and say, Jesus, for that is now how we appear before the holiness of God, dressed in Christ's righteousness. Now remember, chapter 7, Paul is dealing with this question in chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And here's the question. You're not under the authority of the law anymore. The prison door is open. Imagine someone in Swansea jail. Uh, they come to the end of their sentence. And uh, they open the gates. They let them out. What's the first thing they're going to do? Well, they've been planning all sorts of things, some of them. First thing some of them are going to do probably is head to the pub. Others are going to maybe go and see their mates or go for a walk, go for a run, breathe the fresh air, do whatever they were planning to do when their liberty was take away from, taken away from them. Why? Now I'm a free man or a free woman. I can do whatever I want. Not so the Christian. It is not freedom to do as you wish. No, instead now we have been set free, verse 4, in order that we might bear fruit to God and, verse 9, to serve in the new way of the Spirit. I think we've got that this morning now, haven't we? But here's the issue. What does that mean in practice? Something extraordinary has happened to you. 
through faith in Jesus Christ. It's deeply, profoundly radical. You've been released from the authority of the law. But what does that now mean for you and your living? Well, Paul, in this passage, in particular, appears to emphasize three things. I've been stressing two, but there actually is a third. And I'm going to take that third one first. And it's found in verse 4, and it's this. Belonging to another. That's the first consequence of being released from the law. You belong to another. You hear stories, don't you, of people being released from prison or released from custody, and the very next thing that happens to them, as soon as they get outside, they get arrested again for something else. I think that's terrible, isn't it? Well, it's necessary, isn't it? But that, that's, you know, it must be a terrible shock to come out of police custody and immediately get arrested again. Well, it's a little bit like that in the Christian life. You say, hang on a minute, I don't like the sound of that. Well, it is, but hear me out. You're released from the custody of the law, the authority of the law. And the moment that happens, Christ puts his nail-pierced hand upon you and says, you are now in my custody. There's never free for all. You're either, that's why Paul was saying in chapter 6, either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. We now belong to another. And I just want to remind you this morning, you're a Christian. You belong to another. Peter is great on this in his epistles. Uh, he speaks about this world. What's happening? We're just passing through. Why? We belong to another. And so all those hassles in work, and all those demands upon your time and your emotions and all those things that seem so important in the eyes of this world. And they are important, let's face it. They are not for you as a Christian of ultimate importance. Why? You belong to another. Money. The way in which people live today, isn't it? For possessions. Christmas is coming. And all the advertising machinery gets rolled out. And, uh, you know, you buy into it to a certain degree. But the overwhelming message of materialism, the Christian doesn't buy into. Why? We belong to another. We're of a whole different context now as Christians. And your identity as a Christian is found in one particular place. Your identity is not that you're a mother a father, though you may be those things. Your identity is not that you're Welsh or English. Maybe to a degree is in those things. Your identity is not your job. Your identity is not the fact you're retired or you're unemployed. Your identity is not your illness or your disease or your disability or your hobby or your interest or whatever way in which people may speak of you. Ultimately, as a Christian, your identity is this. I belong to another. I'm in Christ. Do you know, many, many of the pastoral problems that we have, many of the spiritual problems that we have, are because we don't understand our identity in Christ. That primarily, above all things, who we are in Christ. And if you're a Christian here this morning, and for somehow, through the temptations of this world, you are seeking to identify yourself by your career, or by your possession or by your leisure pursuits, then you're building your life on a very unnecessary and flawed foundation. The Christian is invited to build their life on their identity in Christ. I am a Christian. I belong to Christ. It's our foundation. Well, the next thing that it means for us in our living is, of course, this matter of producing fruit. Now, sin produces fruit. It was producing it in you before you were converted. Most notably, the Bible speaks about it being death. Freedom from sin now produces new fruit. By the way, this underlines why when someone says they've become a Christian, we have every right to look for a changed life. I grew up as a right royal Pharisee, and I was probably for probably that the first 20 years of my life I could tell you great things about the Bible. I could quote things, and uh, that was the way I was brought up. I had that privilege, and um, I understood quite a lot of doctrine, but I wasn't a Christian. 
and my life proved it. When someone really comes to new birth in Jesus Christ, there is a change. There is a change. And Paul is speaking about here, this change is seen in this way in which we now bear fruit to God. There's a difference. It doesn't mean we change brilliantly overnight and perfectly. We are being changed. That's sanctification. It's a, in many ways, there's a definitive moment, but there's also a process issue. We are being changed. And I hope you are as a Christian, growing more and more like Jesus Christ. And sometimes that's a painful thing, isn't it? There are days when you get up out of bed as a Christian and you feel so wretched as a Christian. You're so aware of your hypocrisy. You're so aware of your sin and your failure and things that you've done. And that's the work of the Spirit and the Word sometimes to make us thoroughly miserable so that we might run to Christ and ask Him for more strength and more grace to live like Jesus. But all the time He is changing us. We must also always be cautious of anyone who claims to be a Christian, but within whom there is no changed life. So there is now new fruit. And the stress in this verse is on the fact that we bear fruit, we produce it. It's a regular thing. It isn't there just once a week when we turn up to church on a Sunday, or we happen to do something. No, there's this regular bearing fruit in our lives that everyone is to see. And we bear it to God. Now, this is, of course, entirely consistent with the Bible's teaching on the Christian life. Do you remember Jesus' own words in John 15? He speaks about himself being the true vine. My father is the gardener. My father cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Why? Because it's not authentic. Bearing fruit is the direct consequence of being in Christ. That's why Jesus in John 15 goes on to say, remain in me and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Which, by the way, is wonderfully good news because you say to yourself, well, I do trust Jesus. I have put my faith in him. I've asked him to forgive me. But when I look at my life, I see whole areas of my life where I'm failing. You see, I'm such a terrible gossip. Or from time to time under pressure, I will tell lies. Or there are things that sometimes I find myself drawn to, to look at or to think about, which I know are unwholesome and unsavory and sinful. And when I'm in those moments, I feel so radically powerless. Where in the world, do you say, am I going to find power for transformation, for change and growth? Ah, Jesus says. The answer is very simple. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. We need the power of Christ in us to change us, to sanctify us, to enable us to bear fruit to God. And in fact, the whole purpose of the Christian life is bearing fruit to God. I bet you've never thought of the Christian life in that way, some of you. If someone was to ping you in work tomorrow, or in the queue in the post office, or in Morrison's, as the Tesco's, other supermarkets are available, or wherever you happen to be, and says, you're a Christian, what's it all about, the Christian life? I wonder if the first thing you'd say is it's about bearing fruit to God. But that is what Jesus says in John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Interesting, isn't it? And it's exactly what Paul is saying here. And you are sat there and up there saying to yourself, okay, so what in the world is this fruit? And probably the best answer is found in Galatians 5, 19 to 23, where Paul starts off by showing us what the fruit of the law and sin, rather, in us produces. It's a terrible list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idols, witchcraft, hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's what sin produces to varying degrees. But then he says this, but, what a wonderful but it is, isn't it? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the fruit he's talking about. 
That's what being released from the law looks like. It is not to be someone wrapped up in a whole new bunch of rules and regulations as a legalist. That is not what you've been released from the law for. Neither have you been released from the law to live as a free-for-all. You have been released from the law to bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life. So you and I must examine ourselves regularly to see that the fruit of the Spirit is there and it's growing. And what do you see in your life? Let me ask you that this morning. What are you known for? Are you known for being cranky and difficult, critical and awkward, a prickly kind of person? Is your life consistent with the work of the Spirit of Christ? What do you long for in your life in terms of your character? And your personality. Well, the last thing that we're told in terms of belonging means also belonging to Christ is not only about identity, it's not only about bearing fruit, but it's now also about serving. Verse 6 serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code, sorry, that's, yes, that is verse 6, the end of verse 6, serve. Now, serve is a word, again, points to the way in which we live our lives now that we've been released from the law. So the guy who gets out of Swansea jail tomorrow morning, the first thing he says is, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I want to do this, I want to go there, I want to say this, I'm going to go after this bloke who got me in there, or whatever it is. He can say those things, but the Christian has been released from the prison of the law, immediately starts to say, what does Jesus want me to do? How does he want me to speak? Where does he want me to go? What does he want me to do? Now the stress in verse 6 is that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Written code, you say it sounds like something out of Dan Brown. What is it? Well, it's the, it's the, it's again, it's essentially a, re a reference to the law of God, written down on tablets of stone, handed to Moses on the top of Sinai, and the other parts of the law given to him in, at later times. You're not to serve in that old way anymore. Instead, you're to serve in the new way of the Spirit. Now, I have to say to you that I think this bit in Romans 7 is really tricky to get right. So I want you to come with me now. We work on this together. Because already some of you are thinking, well, is the law really that bad? Uh, the old way of the written code. After all, you just correctly pointed out, it was given to Moses on Sinai. And there was that amazing occasion when God comes down. And uh, are you saying that that's all bad now? So what is Paul saying when he speaks about the fact that we don't serve in that way anymore? Instead, we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Well, who's this written to? Do you remember? Look at verse 1. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking, what does it say? To men who know the law. And last time when we looked at this, you remember right at the beginning of this sermon this morning, I reminded you that there was this Jew-Gentile tension in the church. And there are times in Romans when Paul seems to turn to the Gentile believers and address them directly and show them that things that are a particular issue for them as Gentiles have their solution in the gospel. And then there are times when Paul addresses Jewish believers and their particular issues and gets them to see that those issues as well have their solution in the same gospel. And it's at this moment I think he's turning, in chapter 7 particularly, to our Jewish brothers and sisters who had recently been converted. There you have it in verse 1. I am speaking to men who know the law, the law of God. You're familiar with it. And they were. They'd grown up with it. They knew it by heart. 
Gentile believers, they'd be sitting there listening to this letter saying, you know the law, hang on a minute, remind me. I'm not sure I can even remember the Ten Commandments. It's all brand new to me. And it was. It wasn't part of their culture. But for Jewish converts, it was. And so he's writing to them and with them particularly in mind. So how does that help us understand this whole business in verse 6 of serving in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And basically, I think the answer is this. The old way of the written code is a reference to the old covenant demands on Israel, which were complex, elaborate. We read in the Reading the Bible Together scheme that we're doing as a church, last month we read, didn't we, from Exodus. And we had the beginning of a glimpse there at the extent of the law of God, and we'll see it in more detail in Leviticus and Numbers when we get to those books. But we saw there, for example, that temple worship, when it came to the construction of the tabernacle, was incredibly detailed, incredibly demanding, incredibly exacting, so much so that God had to pour out his spirit on workmen to get it right. It was so demanding. Temple worship, sacrifice, the whole thing of the Sabbath, dietary laws, clothing laws, civil laws for society, laws about crime, laws about property, laws about agriculture. It was incredibly exacting, incredibly demanding. But now, says Paul to these Jewish brothers and sisters, you're Christians and you've been released from the law. And here in particular he says, from the old way of the written code. Now as a Christian, it's different. Now you serve in the new way of the Spirit. Why? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and your faith in him is enough. You don't have to roll out of bed wondering whether you've got the wrong fabric sewn together or what's on the menu for tea today or lunch, whether it's going to break an Old Testament dietary law, whether you can have black pudding or shellfish. You don't have to worry about those things anymore. You don't have to worry about whether you've got a parapet around your upstairs part of your house and all of those sorts of things that were recorded and required under the old covenant law. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Why? Well, says Paul, here's good news. You serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Friends, I realize that's difficult for us to get because we're Gentile converts. We're not those, as Paul refers to here in verse 1, who speak, who he is speaking to as men who know the law. But the big message we take out of this surely has to be that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. And it is a wonderful freedom. And perhaps, if anything, in that reference to the fact that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code is a challenge to us not to get tangled up in the awful, awful disease and corrupting influence of legalism. It is like acid and poison in the bloodstream of the believer. Have nothing to do with it. So in all of these things here in Romans 7, Paul's handling of the law, and it is complex. Let's face it, anything to do with law is, isn't it? Whether it's a boundary dispute between two neighbours or something to do with the car or something to do with what the government might try to do, once you start to hear people talking about law, it's complex and it's detailed. And in many ways, that is absolutely true with God. But the great thing is this. There is something that cuts through all the red tape. There is something that cuts through all the small print. And it cuts through it perfectly. Not to hoodwink us. Not to con us. But instead to secure us. And the thing that cuts through it all is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That brings us to this place where we say the law with its requirements. No longer can have nothing. Anything at all. To do with me. My Saviour's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. Can you say that today? Do you have this freedom as we conclude here this morning? Are you free? That's what Christianity calls you to. The freedom now to bear fruit 
The freedom to live and to serve in the Spirit. The freedom of belonging to Christ. Do you have this freedom? On this Remembrance Sunday, I have been struck very powerfully this morning by these words in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Today, around our nation, around the Commonwealth, in other parts of the world, the civilized world, there is the remembrance of the sting of death. It is a dreadful thing. A hundred years since the outbreak of the First World War, 37 million military and civilian people died. A phenomenal industrial scale destruction and expression of the sting of death. World War II, it said, there was not a single person on the planet whose life was not in some ways affected by the evil of the Second World War. The war is still going on in our world today. The sting of death is very powerful. And the power of sin, Paul says, is the law. Do you know today, we also remember the death of Dylan Thomas. He died uh, many, several years ago on this day. When he was 19, he wrote the poem, and death shall have no dominion. Do you realize those words were taken from Romans 6, verse 9? Except as well as taking those words, Thomas tinkered with those words because it's not quite what Paul wrote. Paul did not write, and Thomas was using the King James Version language, and death shall have no dominion. What Paul wrote was this, and death has no dominion over him. The words spoken of Jesus Christ, they're not words of aspiration and hope, that perhaps one day death will no longer have the power that it does over us as human beings. That power that we remember today on this Remembrance Sunday, the power which is driven by the law. It's not an aspiration, you see, no. In Jesus Christ, death has no dominion. And the reason is he has risen from the dead. And that phrase, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, is found in a context. And here is the context, and you know it well. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But, thanks be to God, he has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ today, you are released from the law. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. So last question for you this morning is simply this. Are you in Christ? And what a great thing awaits you if you're not. Freedom from the curse of the law. Freedom to bear fruit to God and to serve him in the new way of the spirit. That's why you must put your faith today and trust in Jesus Christ. He's the only hope before the issue of sin and the law of God. He's the only refuge. He's the only rock which we can run to. He's the only place of shelter in the storm. He is the only hope for you and for me and for our broken world. So be found today, no matter how young or old you might be, in Jesus Christ. Call out to him now. Say in the simplicity of your own words, Jesus Christ, I need you more than anything. Come to me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Release me. And set me free.